Book 22. Thus the Trojans in the city, scared like fawns, wiped the sweat from off them and drank to quench their thirst, leaning against the goodly battlements. While the Achaeans with their shields laid upon their shoulders drew close up to the walls. But stern fate bade Hector stay where he was before Ilius and the Scian gates. Then Phoebus Apollo spoke to the son of Peleus saying, Why, son of Peleus, do you, who are but man, give chase to me who am immortal? Have you not yet found out that it is a god whom you pursue so furiously? You did not harass the Trojans whom you had routed, and now they are within their walls, while you have been decoyed hither away from them. Me you cannot kill, for death can take no hold upon me. Achilles was greatly angered and said, You have balked me, far darter, most malicious of all gods, and have drawn me away from the wall, where many another man would have bitten the dust ere he got within Ilius. You have robbed me of great glory and have saved the Trojans at no risk to yourself, for you have nothing to fear, but I would indeed have my revenge if it were in my power to do so. On this, with fell intent he made towards the city, and as the winning horse in a chariot race strains every nerve when he is flying over the plain, even so fast and furiously did the limbs of Achilles bear him onwards. King Priam was first to note him as he scoured the plain, all radiant as the star which men call Orion's hound, and whose beams blaze forth in time of harvest more brilliantly than those of any other that shines by night. Brightest of them all though he be, he yet bodes ill for mortals, for he brings fire and fever in his train, even so did Achilles' armor gleam on his breast as he sped onwards. Priam raised a cry and beat his head with his hands as he lifted them up and shouted out to his dear son, imploring him to return, but Hector still stayed before the gates, for his heart was set upon doing battle with Achilles. The old man reached out his arms towards him and bade him for pity's sake come within the walls. Hector, he cried, my son, stay not to face this man alone and unsupported, or you will meet death at the hands of the son of Peleus, for he is mightier than you. Monster that he is! Would indeed that the gods loved him no better than I do, for so, dogs and vultures would soon devour him as he lay stretched on earth, and a load of grief would be lifted from my heart, for many a brave son has he reft from me. Either by killing them or selling them away in the islands that are beyond the sea, even now I miss two sons from among the Trojans who have thronged within the city, Lycaon and Polydorus, whom Lothopyrus among women bore me. Should they be still alive and in the hands of the Achaeans, we will ransom them with gold and bronze, of which we have store, for the old man Altus endowed his daughter richly. But if they are already dead and in the house of Hades, sorrow will it be to us two who were their parents, albeit the grief of others will be more short-lived unless you two perish at the hands of Achilles. Come, then, my son, within the city, to be the guardian of Trojan men and Trojan women, or you will both lose your own life and afford a mighty triumph to the son of Peleus. Have pity also on your unhappy father while life yet remains to him, on me, whom the son of Saturn will destroy by a terrible doom on the threshold of old age, after I have seen my son slain and my daughters hailed away as captives. My bridal chambers pillaged, little children dashed to earth amid the rage of battle, and my son's wives dragged away by the cruel hands of the Achaeans. In the end fierce hounds will tear me in pieces at my own gates after someone has beaten the life out of my body with sword or spearhounds that I myself reared and fed at my own table to guard my gates. But who will yet lap my blood and then lie all distraught at my doors? When a young man falls by the sword in battle, he may lie where he is and there is nothing unseemly. Let what will be seen, all is honorable in death, but when an old man is slain there is nothing in this world more pitiable than that dogs should defile his gray hair and beard and all that men hide for shame. The old man tore his gray hair as he spoke, but he moved not the heart of Hector. His mother hard by wept and moaned aloud as she bared her bosom and pointed to the breast which had suckled him. Hector, she cried, weeping bitterly the while, Hector, my son, spurn not this breast, but have pity upon me too, if I have ever given you comfort from my own bosom, think on it now, dear son, and come within the wall to protect us from this man. Stand not without to meet him. Should the wretch kill you, neither I nor your richly dowered wife shall ever weep, dear offshoot of myself, over the bed on which you lie, 
for dogs will devour you at the ships of the Achaeans. Thus did the two with many tears implore their son, but they moved not the heart of Hector, and he stood his ground awaiting huge Achilles as he drew nearer towards him. As serpent in its den upon the mountains, full fed with deadly poisons. Waits for the approach of man, he is filled with fury and his eyes glare terribly as he goes writhing round his den, even so Hector leaned his shield against a tower that jutted out from the wall and stood where he was, undaunted. Alas, said he to himself in the heaviness of his heart, if I go within the gates, Polydamus will be the first to heap reproach upon me. For it was he that urged me to lead the Trojans back to the city on that awful night when Achilles again came forth against us. I would not listen, but it would have been indeed better if I had done so. Now that my folly has destroyed the host, I dare not look Trojan men and Trojan women in the face, lest a worse man should say, Hector has ruined us by his self-confidence. Surely it would be better for me to return after having fought Achilles and slain him, or to die gloriously here before the city. What, again, if I were to lay down my shield and helmet, lean my spear against the wall and go straight up to noble Achilles? What if I were to promise to give up Helen, who was the fountainhead of all this war, and all the treasure that Alexandrus brought with him in his ships to Troy, I, and to let the Achaeans divide the half of everything that the city contains among themselves? I might make the Trojans, by the mouths of their princes, take a solemn oath that they would hide nothing, but would divide into two shares all that is within the city, but why argue with myself in this way? Were I to go up to him he would show me no kind of mercy, he would kill me then and there as easily as though I were a woman, when I had off my armor. There is no parleying with him from some rock or oak tree as young men and maidens prattle with one another. Better fight him at once, and learn to which of us Jove will vouchsafe victory. Thus did he stand and ponder, but Achilles came up to him as it were Mars himself, plumed lord of battle. From his right shoulder he brandished his terrible spear of Pelian ash, and the bronze gleamed around him like flashing fire or the rays of the rising sun. Fear fell upon Hector as he beheld him, and he dared not stay longer where he was but fled in dismay from before the gates, while Achilles darted after him at his utmost speed. As a mountain falcon, swiftest of all birds, swoops down upon some cowering dove, the dove flies before him but the falcon with a shrill scream follows close after. Resolved to have her, even so did Achilles make straight for Hector with all his might, while Hector fled under the Trojan wall as fast as his limbs could take him. On they flew along the wagon road that ran hard by under the wall, past the lookout station, and past the weather-beaten wild fig tree, till they came to two fair springs which feed the river's commander. One of these two springs is warm, and steam rises from it as smoke from a burning fire, but the other even in summer is as cold as hail or snow, or the ice that forms on water. Here, hard by the springs, are the goodly washing troughs of stone, where in the time of peace before the coming of the Achaeans the wives and fair daughters of the Trojans used to wash their clothes. Past these did they fly, the one in front and the other giving chase behind him, good was the man that fled, but better far was he that followed after, and swiftly indeed did they run, for the prize was no mere beast for sacrifice or bullock's hide. As it might be for a common foot race, but they ran for the life of Hector. As horses in a chariot race speed round the turning posts when they are running for some great prize, a tripod or woman, at the games in honor of some dead hero, so did these two run full speed three times round the city of Priam. All the gods watched them, and the sire of gods and men was the first to speak. Alas, said he, my eyes behold a man who is dear to me being pursued round the walls of Troy. My heart is full of pity for Hector, who has burned the thigh bones of many a heifer in my honour, one while on the crests of many valleyed Ida, and again on the citadel of Troy. And now I see noble Achilles in full pursuit of him round the city of Priam. What say you? Consider among yourselves and decide whether we shall now save him or let him fall, valiant though he be, before Achilles, son of Peleus. Then Minerva said, Father, wielder of the lightning, lord of cloud and storm, what mean you? Would you pluck this mortal whose doom has long been decreed out of the jaws of death? Do as you will, but we others shall not be of a mind with you. And Jove answered, My child, Tritoborn, 
take heart. I did not speak in full earnest, and I will let you have your way. Do without let or hindrance as you are minded. Thus did he urge Minerva who was already eager, and down she darted from the topmost summits of Olympus. Achilles was still in full pursuit of Hector, as a hound chasing a fawn which he has started from its covert on the mountains, and hunts through glade and thicket. The fawn may try to elude him by crouching under cover of a bush, but he will scent her out and follow her up until he gets her, even so there was no escape for Hector from the fleet son of Peleus. Whenever he made a set to get near the Dardanian gates and under the walls, that his people might help him by showering down weapons from above, Achilles would gain on him and head him back towards the plain, keeping himself always on the city side. As a man in a dream who fails to lay hands upon another whom he is pursuing, the one cannot escape nor the other overtake, even so neither could Achilles come up with Hector, nor Hector break away from Achilles. Nevertheless he might even yet have escaped death had not the time come when Apollo, who thus far had sustained his strength and nerved his running, was now no longer to stay by him. Achilles made signs to the Achaean host, and shook his head to show that no man was to aim a dart at Hector, lest another might win the glory of having hit him and he might himself come in second. Then, at last, as they were nearing the fountains for the fourth time, the father of all balanced his golden scales and placed a doom in each of them, one for Achilles and the other for Hector. As he held the scales by the middle, the doom of Hector fell down deep into the house of Hades, and then Phoebus Apollo left him. Thereon Minerva went close up to the son of Peleus and said, Noble Achilles, favoured of heaven, we too shall surely take back to the ships a triumph for the Achaeans by slaying Hector, for all his lust of battle. Do what Apollo may as he lies groveling before his father, Aegis-bearing Jove, Hector cannot escape us longer. Stay here and take breath, while I go up to him and persuade him to make a stand and fight you. Thus spoke Minerva. Achilles obeyed her gladly, and stood still, leaning on his bronze-pointed ashen spear, while Minerva left him and went after Hector in the form and with the voice of Deiphobus. She came close up to him and said, Dear brother, I see you are hard-pressed by Achilles who is chasing you at full speed round the city of Priam, let us await his onset and stand on our defence. And Hector answered, Deiphobus, you have always been dearest to me of all my brothers, children of Hecuba and Priam, but henceforth I shall rate you yet more highly. Inasmuch as you have ventured outside the wall for my sake when all the others remain inside. Then Minerva said, Dear brother, my father and mother went down on their knees and implored me, as did all my comrades, to remain inside, so great a fear has fallen upon them all, but I was in an agony of grief when I beheld you. Now, therefore, let us two make a stand and fight, and let there be no keeping our spears in reserve, that we may learn whether Achilles shall kill us and bear off our spoils to the ships, or whether he shall fall before you. Thus did Minerva inveigle him by her cunning, and when the two were now close to one another great Hector was first to speak. I will no longer fly you, son of Peleus, said he, as I have been doing hitherto. Three times have I fled round the mighty city of Priam, without daring to withstand you, but now, let me either slay or be slain, for I am in the mind to face you. Let us, then, give pledges to one another by our gods, who are the fittest witnesses and guardians of all covenants. Let it be agreed between us that if Jove vouchsafes me the longer stay and I take your life, I am not to treat your dead body in any unseemly fashion, but when I have stripped you of your armour, I am to give up your body to the Achaeans. And do you likewise? Achilles glared at him and answered, Fool, prate not to me about covenants. There can be no covenants between men and lions, wolves and lambs can never be of one mind, but hate each other out and out and through. Therefore there can be no understanding between you and me, nor may there be any covenants between us, till one or other shall fall and glut grim Mars with his life's blood. Put forth all your strength. You have need now to prove yourself indeed a bold soldier and man of war. You have no more chance, and Pallas Minerva will forthwith vanquish you by my spear, you shall now pay me in full for the grief you have caused me on account of my comrades whom you have killed in battle. He poised his spear as he spoke and hurled it. Hector saw it coming and avoided it, he watched it and crouched down so that it flew over his head and stuck in the ground beyond. 
Minerva then snatched it up and gave it back to Achilles without Hector seeing her. Hector thereon said to the son of Peleus, You have missed your aim, Achilles, peer of the gods, and Jove has not yet revealed to you the hour of my doom, though you made sure that he had done so. You were a false-tongued liar when you deemed that I should forget my valour and quail before you. You shall not drive spear into the back of a runaway, drive it, should heaven so grant you power, drive it into me as I make straight towards you. And now for your own part avoid my spear if you can, would that you might receive the whole of it into your body, if you were once dead the Trojans would find the war an easier matter, for it is you who have harmed them most. He poised his spear as he spoke and hurled it. His aim was true for he hit the middle of Achilles' shield, but the spear rebounded from it, and did not pierce it. Hector was angry when he saw that the weapon had sped from his hand in vain, and stood there in dismay for he had no second spear. With a loud cry he called Deiphobus and asked him for one, but there was no man. Then he saw the truth and said to himself, Alas! The gods have lured me on to my destruction. I deemed that the hero Deiphobus was by my side, but he is within the wall, and Minerva has inveigled me. Death is now indeed exceedingly near at hand and there is no way out of it, for so Jove and his son Apollo the far darter have willed it, though heretofore they have been ever ready to protect Mimi doom has come upon me. Let me not then die ingloriously and without a struggle, but let me first do some great thing that shall be told among men hereafter. As he spoke he drew the keen blade that hung so great and strong by his side. And gathering himself together be sprang on Achilles like a soaring eagle which swoops down from the clouds on to some lamb or timid hare, even so did Hector brandish his sword and spring upon Achilles. Achilles mad with rage darted towards him, with his wondrous shield before his breast, and his gleaming helmet, made with four layers of metal, nodding fiercely forward. The thick tresses of gold with which Vulcan had crested the helmet floated round it, and as the evening star that shines brighter than all others through the stillness of night. Even such was the gleam of the spear which Achilles poised in his right hand, fraught with the death of noble Hector. He eyed his fair flesh over and over to see where he could best wound it, but all was protected by the goodly armor of which Hector had spoiled Patroclus after he had slain him. Save only the throat where the collarbones divide the neck from the shoulders, and this is a most deadly place. Here then did Achilles strike him as he was coming on towards him. And the point of his spear went right through the fleshy part of the neck, but it did not sever his windpipe so that he could still speak. Hector fell headlong, and Achilles vaunted over him saying, Hector, you deemed that you should come off scatheless when you were spoiling Patroclus, and wrecked not of myself who was not with him. Fool that you were, for I, his comrade, mightier far than he, was still left behind him at the ships, and now I have laid you low. The Achaeans shall give him all due funeral rites, while dogs and vultures shall work their will upon yourself. Then Hector said, As the life ebbed out of him, I pray you by your life and knees, and by your parents, let not dogs devour me at the ships of the Achaeans, but accept the rich treasure of gold and bronze which my father and mother will offer you and send my body home, that the Trojans and their wives may give me my dues of fire when I am dead. Achilles glared at him and answered, Dog, talk not to me neither of knees nor parents. Would that I could be as sure of being able to cut your flesh into pieces and eat it raw, for the ill you have done me, as I am that nothing shall save you from the dogs, it shall not be. Though they bring ten or twentyfold ransom and weigh it out for me on the spot, with promise of yet more hereafter. Though Priam son of Dardanus should bid them offer me your weight in gold, even so your mother shall never lay you out and make lament over the son she bore, but dogs and vultures shall eat you utterly up. Hector with his dying breath then said, I know you what you are, and was sure that I should not move you, for your heart is hard as iron. Look to it that I bring not heaven's anger upon you on the day when Paris and Phoebus Apollo, valiant though you be, shall slay you at the Scian gates. When he had thus said the shrouds of death enfolded him, whereon his soul went out of him and flew down to the house of Hades, lamenting its sad fate that it should enjoy youth and strength no longer. But Achilles said, speaking to the dead body, Die, for my part one will accept my fate whensoever Jove and the other gods see fit to send it. As he spoke he drew his spear from the body and set it on one side. 
Then he stripped the blood-stained armor from Hector's shoulders while the other Achaeans came running up to view his wondrous strength and beauty, and no one came near him without giving him a fresh wound. Then would one turn to his neighbor and say, It is easier to handle Hector now than when he was flinging fire onto our ships and as he spoke he would thrust his spear into him anew. When Achilles had done spoiling Hector of his armor, he stood among the Argives and said, My friends, princes and counselors of the Argives, now that heaven has vouchsafed us to overcome this man. Who has done us more hurt than all the others together, consider whether we should not attack the city in force, and discover in what mind the Trojans may be. We should thus learn whether they will desert their city now that Hector has fallen, or will still hold out even though he is no longer living. But why argue with myself in this way, while Patroclus is still lying at the ships unburied, and unmourned, he whom I can never forget so long as I am alive and my strength fails not. Though men forget their dead when once they are within the house of Hades, yet not even there will I forget the comrade whom I have lost. Now, therefore, Achaean youths, let us raise the song of victory and go back to the ships taking this man along with us. For we have achieved a mighty triumph and have slain noble Hector to whom the Trojans prayed throughout their city as though he were a god. On this he treated the body of Hector with contumely, he pierced the sinews at the back of both his feet from heel to ankle and passed thongs of ox hide through the slits he had made, thus he made the body fast to his chariot. Letting the head trail upon the ground. Then when he had put the goodly armor on the chariot and had himself mounted, he lashed his horses on and they flew forward nothing loath. The dust rose from Hector as he was being dragged along, his dark hair flew all abroad, and his head once so comely was laid low on earth, for Jove had now delivered him into the hands of his foes to do him outrage in his own land. Thus was the head of Hector being dishonored in the dust. His mother tore her hair, and flung her veil from her with a loud cry as she looked upon her son. His father made piteous moan, and throughout the city the people fell to weeping and wailing. It was as though the whole of frowning Aelius was being smirched with fire. Hardly could the people hold Priam back in his hot haste to rush without the gates of the city. He groveled in the mire and besought them, calling each one of them by his name. Let be, my friends, he cried, and for all your sorrow, suffer me to go single-handed to the ships of the Achaeans. Let me beseech this cruel and terrible man, if maybe he will respect the feeling of his fellow men, and have compassion on my old age. His own father is even such another as myself, Peleus, who bred him and reared him to be the bane of us Trojans, and of myself more than of all others. Many a son of mine has he slain in the flower of his youth, and yet, grieve for these as I may, I do so for one, Hector, more than for them all, and the bitterness of my sorrow will bring me down to the house of Hades. Would that he had died in my arms, for so both his ill-starred mother who bore him, and myself, should have had the comfort of weeping and mourning over him. Thus did he speak with many tears, and all the people of the city joined in his lament. Hecuba then raised the cry of wailing among the Trojans. Alas, my son, she cried, what have I left to live for now that you are no more? Night and day did I glory in you throughout the city, for you were a tower of strength to all in Troy, and both men and women alike hailed you as a god. So long as you lived you were their pride, but now death and destruction have fallen upon you. Hector's wife had as yet heard nothing, for no one had come to tell her that her husband had remained without the gates. She was at her loom in an inner part of the house, weaving a double purple web, and embroidering it with many flowers. She told her maids to set a large tripod on the fire, so as to have a warm bath ready for Hector when he came out of battle. Poor woman, she knew not that he was now beyond the reach of baths, and that Minerva had laid him low by the hands of Achilles. She heard the cry coming as from the wall, and trembled in every limb. The shuttle fell from her hands, and again she spoke to her waiting women. Two of you, she said, come with me that I may learn what it is that has befallen, I heard the voice of my husband's honored mother. My own heart beats as though it would come into my mouth and my limbs refuse to carry me, some great misfortune for Priam's children must be at hand. May I never live to hear it, but I greatly fear that Achilles has cut off the retreat of brave Hector and has chased him on to the plain where he was single-handed. 
I fear he may have put an end to the reckless daring which possessed my husband, who would never remain with the body of his men, but would dash on far in front, foremost of them all in valor. Her heart beat fast, and as she spoke she flew from the house like a maniac, with her waiting women following after. When she reached the battlements and the crowd of people, she stood looking out upon the wall, and saw Hector being borne away in front of the city, the horses dragging him without heed or care over the ground towards the ships of the Achaeans. Her eyes were then shrouded as with the darkness of night and she fell fainting backwards. She tore the attiring from her head and flung it from her, the frontlet and net with its plated band, and the veil which golden Venus had given her on the day when Hector took her with him from the house of Eshan. After having given countless gifts of wooing for her sake. Her husband's sisters and the wives of his brothers crowded round her and supported her, for she was fain to die in her distraction. When she again presently breathed and came to herself, she sobbed and made lament among the Trojans saying, Woe is me, O Hector! Woe, indeed, that to share a common lot we were born, you at Troy in the house of Priam! And I at Thebes under the wooded mountain of Placus in the house of Aetian who brought me up when I was a child, ill-starred sire of an ill-starred daughter, would that he had never begotten me! You are now going into the house of Hades under the secret places of the earth, and you leave me a sorrowing widow in your house. The child, of whom you and I are the unhappy parents, is as yet a mere infant. Now that you are gone, O Hector, you can do nothing for him nor he for you. Even though he escape the horrors of this woeful war with the Achaeans, yet shall his life henceforth be one of labor and sorrow, for others will seize his lands. The day that robs a child of his parents severs him from his own kind, his head is bowed, his cheeks are wet with tears, and he will go about destitute among the friends of his father, plucking one by the cloak and another by the shirt. Some one or other of these may so far pity him as to hold the cup for a moment towards him and let him moisten his lips, but he must not drink enough to wet the roof of his mouth. Then one whose parents are alive will drive him from the table with blows and angry words. Out with you, he will say, you have no father here, and the child will go crying back to his widowed mother, he, Astyanax, who erewhile would sit upon his father's knees, and have none but the daintiest and choicest morsels set before him. When he had played till he was tired and went to sleep, he would lie in a bed, in the arms of his nurse, on a soft couch, knowing neither want nor care, whereas now that he has lost his father his lot will be full of hardship, he, whom the Trojans name Astyanax, because you, O Hector, were the only defense of their gates and battlements. The wriggling writhing worms will now eat you at the ships, far from your parents, when the dogs have glutted themselves upon you. You will lie naked, although in your house you have fine and goodly raiment made by hands of women. This will I now burn, it is of no use to you, for you can never again wear it, and thus you will have respect shown you by the Trojans both men and women. In such wise did she cry aloud amid her tears, and the women joined in her lament. Book 23 Thus did they make their moan throughout the city, while the Achaeans when they reached the Hellespont went back every man to his own ship. But Achilles would not let the Myrmidons go, and spoke to his brave comrade saying, Myrmidons, famed horsemen and my own trusted friends, not yet, forsooth, let us unyoke, but with horse and chariot draw near to the body and mourn Patroclus. In due honour to the dead. When we have had full comfort of lamentation we will unyoke our horses and take supper all of us here. On this they all joined in a cry of wailing and Achilles led them in their lament. Thrice did they drive their chariots all sorrowing round the body, and Thetis stirred within them a still deeper yearning. The sands of the seashore and the men's armour were wet with their weeping, so great a minister of fear was he whom they had lost. Chief in all their mourning was the son of Peleus, he laid his blood-stained hand on the breast of his friend. Farewell, he cried, Patroclus, even in the house of Hades. I will now do all that I erewhile promised you, I will drag Hector hither and let dogs devour him raw, twelve noble sons of Trojans will I also slay before your pyre to avenge you. As he spoke he treated the body of noble Hector with contumely, laying it at full length in the dust beside the bier of Patroclus. The others then put off every man his armour, took the horses from their chariots, 
and seated themselves in great multitude by the ship of the fleet descendant of Aeacus, who thereon feasted them with an abundant funeral banquet. Many a goodly ox, with many a sheep and bleeding goat did they butcher and cut up, many a tusk bore moreover, fat and well-fed, did they singe and set to roast in the flames of Vulcan. And rivulets of blood flowed all round the place where the body was lying. Then the princes of the Achaeans took the son of Peleus to Agamemnon, but hardly could they persuade him to come with them, so wroth was he for the death of his comrade. As soon as they reached Agamemnon's tent they told the serving men to set a large tripod over the fire in case they might persuade the son of Peleus to wash the clotted gore from this body, but he denied them sternly. And swore it with a solemn oath, saying, Nay, by King Jove, first and mightiest of all gods, it is not meet that water should touch my body, till I have laid Patroclus on the flames, have built him a barrow. And shaved my head, for so long as I live no such second sorrow shall ever draw nigh me. Now, therefore, let us do all that this sad festival demands, but at break of day, King Agamemnon, bid your men bring wood, and provide all else that the dead may duly take into the realm of darkness. The fire shall thus burn him out of our sight the sooner, and the people shall turn again to their own labours. Thus did he speak, and they did even as he had said. They made haste to prepare the meal, they ate, and every man had his full share so that all were satisfied. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, the others went to their rest each in his own tent, but the son of Peleus lay grieving among his myrmidons by the shore of the sounding sea. In an open place where the waves came surging in one after another. Here a very deep slumber took hold upon him and eased the burden of his sorrows, for his limbs were weary with chasing Hector round windy Aeolus. Presently the sad spirit of Patroclus drew near him, like what he had been in stature, voice, and the light of his beaming eyes, clad, too, as he had been clad in life. The spirit hovered over his head and said. You sleep, Achilles, and have forgotten me, you love me living, but now that I am dead you think for me no further. Bury me with all speed that I may pass the gates of Hades. The ghosts, vain shadows of men that can labor no more, drive me away from them, they will not yet suffer me to join those that are beyond the river, and I wander all desolate by the wide gates of the house of Hades. Give me now your hand I pray you, for when you have once given me my dues of fire, never shall I again come forth out of the house of Hades. Never more shall we sit apart and take sweet counsel among the living. The cruel fate which was my birthright has yawned its wide jaws around me, nay, you two Achilles, peer of gods, are doomed to die beneath the wall of the noble Trojans. One prayer more will I make you, if you will grant it. Let not my bones be laid apart from yours, Achilles, but with them. Even as we were brought up together in your own home, what time Menoetius brought me to you as a child from Opoeus because by a sad spite I had killed the son of Amphidamus, not of set purpose, but in childish quarrel over the dice. The night Peleus took me into his house, entreated me kindly, and named me to be your squire, therefore let our bones lie in but a single urn, the two-handled golden vase given to you by your mother. And Achilles answered, Why, true heart, are you come hither to lay these charges upon me? Will of my own self do all as you have bidden me. Draw closer to me, let us once more throw our arms around one another, and find sad comfort in the sharing of our sorrows. He opened his arms towards him as he spoke and would have clasped him in them, but there was nothing, and the spirit vanished as a vapour, gibbering and whining into the earth. Achilles sprang to his feet, smote his two hands, and made lamentation saying, Of a truth even in the house of Hades there are ghosts and phantoms that have no life in them. All night long the sad spirit of Patroclus has hovered overhead making piteous moan, telling me what I am to do for him, and looking wondrously like himself. Thus did he speak and his words set them all weeping and mourning about the poor dumb dead, till rosy-fingered morn appeared. Then King Agamemnon sent men and mules from all parts of the camp, to bring wood, and Marians, squire to Idomeneus, was in charge over them. They went out with woodmen's axes and strong ropes in their hands, and before them went the mules. Uphill and down dale did they go, by straight ways and crooked, and when they reached the heights of many fountained Ida, they laid their axes to the roots of many a tall branching oak that came thundering down as they felled it. 
They split the trees and bound them behind the mules, which then wended their way as they best could through the thick brushwood onto the plain. All who had been cutting wood bore logs, for so Marian's squire to Idomeneus had bidden them, and they threw them down in a line upon the seashore at the place where Achilles would make a mighty monument for Patroclus and for himself. When they had thrown down their great logs of wood over the whole ground, they stayed all of them where they were, but Achilles ordered his brave Myrmidons to gird on their armor, and to yoke each man his horses. They therefore rose, girded on their armor and mounted each his chariot, they and their charioteers with them. The chariots went before, and they that were on foot followed as a cloud in their tens of thousands after. In the midst of them his comrades bore Patroclus and covered him with the locks of their hair which they cut off and threw upon his body. Last came Achilles with his head bowed for sorrow, so noble a comrade was he taking to the house of Hades. When they came to the place of which Achilles had told them they laid the body down and built up the wood. Achilles then bethought him of another matter. He went a space away from the pyre, and cut off the yellow lock which he had let grow for the river Spercheus. He looked all sorrowfully out upon the dark sea, and said, Spercheus, in vain did my father Peleus vow to you that when I returned home to my loved native land I should cut off this lock and offer you a holy hecatomb. Fifty she-goats was I to sacrifice to you there at your springs, where is your grove and your altar fragrant with burnt offerings thus did my father vow, but you have not fulfilled his prayer. Now, therefore, that I shall see my home no more, I give this lock as a keepsake to the hero Patroclus. As he spoke he placed the lock in the hands of his dear comrade, and all who stood by were filled with yearning and lamentation. The sun would have gone down upon their mourning had not Achilles presently said to Agamemnon, son of Atreus, for it is to you that the people will give ear, there is a time to mourn and a time to cease from mourning. Bid the people now leave the pyre and set about getting their dinners, we, to whom the dead is dearest, will see to what is wanted here, and let the other princes also stay by me. When King Agamemnon heard this he dismissed the people to their ships, but those who were about the dead heaped up wood and built a pyre a hundred feet this way and that, then they laid the dead all sorrowfully upon the top of it. They flayed and dressed many fat sheep and oxen before the pyre, and Achilles took fat from all of them and wrapped the body therein from head to foot, heaping the flayed carcasses all round it. Against the beer he leaned two handled jars of honey and unguents, for proud horses did he then cast upon the pyre, groaning the while he did so. The dead hero had had house dogs, two of them did Achilles slay and threw upon the pyre. He also put twelve brave sons of noble Trojans to the sword and laid them with the rest, for he was full of bitterness and fury. Then he committed all to the resistless and devouring might of the fire. He groaned aloud and called on his dead comrade by name. Farewell, he cried, Patroclus, even in the house of Hades, I am now doing all that I have promised you. Twelve brave sons of noble Trojans shall the flames consume along with yourself, but dogs, not fire, shall devour the flesh of Hector son of Priam. Thus did he vaunt, but the dogs came not about the body of Hector, for Jove's daughter Venus kept them off him night and day, and anointed him with ambrosial oil of roses that his flesh might not be torn when Achilles was dragging him about. Phoebus Apollo moreover sent a dark cloud from heaven to earth, which gave shade to the whole place where Hector lay, that the heat of the sun might not parch his body. Now the pyre about dead Patroclus would not kindle. Achilles therefore bethought him of another matter, he went apart and prayed to the two winds Boreas and Zephyrus vowing them goodly offerings. He made them many drink offerings from the golden cup and besought them to come and help him that the wood might make haste to kindle and the dead bodies be consumed. Fleet Iris heard him praying and started off to fetch the winds. They were holding high feast in the house of boisterous Zephyrus when Iris came running up to the stone threshold of the house and stood there, but as soon as they set eyes on her they all came towards her and each of them called her to him. But Iris would not sit down. I cannot stay, she said, I must go back to the streams of Oceanus and the land of the Ethiopians who are offering hecatombs to the immortals, and I would have my share. But Achilles prays that Boreas and shrill Zephyrus will come to him, and he vows them goodly offerings, he would have you blow upon the pyre of Patroclus for whom all the Achaeans are lamenting. With this she left them, 
and the two winds rose with a cry that rent the air and swept the clouds before them. They blew on and on until they came to the sea, and the waves rose high beneath them, but when they reached Troy they fell upon the pyre till the mighty flames roared under the blast that they blew. All night long did they blow hard and beat upon the fire, and all night long did Achilles grasp his double cup, drawing wine from a mixing bowl of gold. And calling upon the spirit of dead Patroclus as he poured it upon the ground until the earth was drenched. As a father mourns when he is burning the bones of his bridegroom's son whose death has wrung the hearts of his parents, even so did Achilles mourn while burning the body of his comrade, pacing round the bier with piteous groaning and lamentation. At length as the morning star was beginning to herald the light which saffron-mantled dawn was soon to suffuse over the sea, the flames fell and the fire began to die. The winds then went home beyond the Thracian sea, which roared and boiled as they swept over it. The son of Peleus now turned away from the pyre and lay down, overcome with toil, till he fell into a sweet slumber. Presently they who were about the son of Atreus drew near in a body, and roused him with the noise and tramp of their coming. He sat upright and said, Son of Atreus, and all other princes of the Achaeans, first pour red wine everywhere upon the fire and quench it, let us then gather the bones of Patroclus son of Menoetius, singling them out with care. They are easily found, for they lie in the middle of the pyre, while all else, both men and horses, has been thrown in a heap and burned at the outer edge. We will lay the bones in a golden urn, in two layers of fat, against the time when I shall myself go down into the house of Hades. As for the barrow, labor not to raise a great one now, but such as is reasonable. Afterwards, let those Achaeans who may be left at the ships when I am gone, build it both broad and high. Thus he spoke and they obeyed the word of the son of Peleus. First they poured red wine upon the thick layer of ashes and quenched the fire. With many tears they singled out the whitened bones of their loved comrade and laid them within a golden urn in two layers of fat, they then covered the urn with a linen cloth and took it inside the tent. They marked off the circle where the barrow should be, made a foundation for it about the pyre, and forthwith heaped up the earth. When they had thus raised a mound they were going away, but Achilles stayed the people and made them sit in assembly. He brought prizes from the ships, cauldrons, tripods, horses and mules, noble oxen, women with fair girdles, and swart iron. The first prize he offered was for the chariot races, a woman skilled in all useful arts, and a three-legged cauldron that had ears for handles, and would hold twenty-two measures. This was for the man who came in first. For the second there was a six-year-old mare, unbroken, and in full to a he-ass, the third was to have a goodly cauldron that had never yet been on the fire, it was still bright as when it left the maker, and would hold four measures. The fourth prize was two talents of gold, and the fifth a two-handled urn as yet unsoiled by smoke. Then he stood up and spoke among the Argives saying, Son of Atreus, and all other Achaeans, these are the prizes that lie waiting the winners of the chariot races. At any other time I should carry off the first prize and take it to my own tent. You know how far my steeds excel all others, for they are immortal, Neptune gave them to my father Peleus, who in his turn gave them to myself. But I shall hold aloof, I and my steeds that have lost their brave and kind driver, who many a time has washed them in clear water and anointed their manes with oil. See how they stand weeping here, with their manes trailing on the ground in the extremity of their sorrow. But do you others set yourselves in order throughout the host, whosoever has confidence in his horses and in the strength of his chariot? Thus spoke the son of Peleus and the drivers of chariots bestirred themselves. First among them all uprose Eumelus, king of men, son of Admetus, a man excellent in horsemanship. Next to him rose mighty Diam son of Tydeus. He yoked the Trojan horses which he had taken from Aeneas, when Apollo bore him out of the fight. Next to him, yellow-haired Menelaus son of Atreus rose and yoked his fleet horses, Agamemnon's mare Eith, and his own horse Podargus. The mare had been given to Agamemnon by Echepolis son of Anchises, that he might not have to follow him to Ilius, but might stay at home and take his ease, for Jove had endowed him with great wealth and he lived in spacious Sicyon. This mare, all eager for the race, did Menelaus put under the yoke. 
Fourth in order Antilochus, son to noble Nestor son of Neleus, made ready his horses. These were bred in Pilus, and his father came up to him to give him good advice of which, however, he stood in but little need. Antilochus, said Nestor, you are young, but Jove and Neptune have loved you well, and have made you an excellent horseman. I need not therefore say much by way of instruction. You are skillful at wheeling your horses round the post, but the horses themselves are very slow, and it is this that will, I fear, mar your chances. The other drivers know less than you do, but their horses are fleeter. Therefore, my dear son, see if you cannot hit upon some artifice whereby you may ensure that the prize shall not slip through your fingers. The woodman does more by skill than by brute force. By skill the pilot guides his storm-tossed bark over the sea, and so by skill one driver can beat another. If a man go wide in rounding this way and that, whereas a man who knows what he is doing may have worse horses, but he will keep them well in hand when he sees the doubling post. He knows the precise moment at which to pull the rein, and keeps his eye well on the man in front of him. I will give you this certain token which cannot escape your notice. There is a stump of a dead tree, oak or pine as it may be, some six feet above the ground, and not yet rotted away by rain, it stands at the fork of the road, it has two white stones set one on each side, and there is a clear course all round it. It may have been a monument to some one long since dead, or it may have been used as a doubling post in days gone by, now, however, it has been fixed on by Achilles as the mark round which the chariots shall turn. Hug it as close as you can, but as you stand in your chariot lean over a little to the left. Urge on your right hand horse with voice and lash, and give him a loose rein, but let the left hand horse keep so close in, that the knave of your will shall almost graze the post. But mind the stone, or you will wound your horses and break your chariot in pieces, which would be sport for others but confusion for yourself. Therefore, my dear son, mind well what you are about, for if you can be first to round the post there is no chance of any one giving you the go-by later. Not even though you had Adrestus's horse Arion behind you, a horse which is of divine race, or those of Laomedon, which are the noblest in this country. When Nestor had made an end of counselling his son he sat down in his place, and fifth in order Marians got ready his horses. They then all mounted their chariots and cast lots. Achilles shook the helmet, and the lot of Antilochus son of Nestor fell out first, next came that of King Eumelus, and after his, those of Menelaus son of Atreus and of Marians. The last place fell to the lot of Diom son of Tydeus, who was the best man of them all. They took their places in line, Achilles showed them the doubling post round which they were to turn, some way off upon the plain. Here he stationed his father's follower Phoenix as umpire, to note the running, and report truly. At the same instant they all of them lashed their horses, struck them with the reins, and shouted at them with all their might. They flew full speed over the plain away from the ships, the dust rose from under them as it were a cloud or whirlwind, and their manes were all flying in the wind. At one moment the chariot seemed to touch the ground, and then again they bounded into the air, the drivers stood erect, and their hearts beat fast and furious in their lust of victory. Each kept calling on his horses, and the horses scoured the plain amid the clouds of dust that they raised. It was when they were doing the last part of the course on their way back towards the sea that their pace was strained to the utmost and it was seen what each could do. The horses of the descendant of Fears now took the lead, and close behind them came the Trojan stallions of Diamond. They seemed as if about to mount Eumelus's chariot, and he could feel their warm breath on his back and on his broad shoulders, for their heads were close to him as they flew over the course. Diamond would have now passed him, or there would have been a dead heat, but Phoebus Apollo despite him made him drop his whip. Tears of anger fell from his eyes as he saw the Maras going on faster than ever, while his own horses lost ground through his having no whip. Minerva saw the trick which Apollo had played the son of Tydeus, so she brought him his whip and put spirit into his horses, moreover she went after the son of Admetus in a rage and broke his yoke for him. The Mares went one to one side of the course, and the other to the other, and the pole was broken against the ground. Eumelus was thrown from his chariot close to the wheel. His elbows, mouth, and nostrils were all torn, and his forehead was bruised above his eyebrows, 
his eyes filled with tears and he could find no utterance. But the son of Tydeus turned his horses aside and shot far ahead, for Minerva put fresh strength into them and covered Diomed himself with glory. Menelaus son of Atreus came next behind him, but Antilochus called to his father's horses. On with you both, he cried, and do your very utmost. I do not bid you try to beat the steeds of the son of Tydeus, for Minerva has put running into them, and has covered Diomed with glory. But you must overtake the horses of the son of Atreus and not be left behind, or Eeth who is so fleet will taunt you. Why, my good fellows, are you lagging? I tell you, and it shall surely be, Nestor will keep neither of you, but will put both of you to the sword, if we win any the worse a prize through your carelessness. Fly after them at your utmost speed. I will hit on a plan for passing them in a narrow part of the way, and it shall not fail me. They feared the rebuke of their master, and for a short space went quicker. Presently Antilochus saw a narrow place where the road had sunk. The ground was broken, for the winter's rain had gathered and had worn the road so that the whole place was deepened. Menelaus was making towards it so as to get there first, for fear of a foul, but Antilochus turned his horses out of the way, and followed him a little on one side. The son of Atreus was afraid and shouted out, Antilochus, you are driving recklessly, rein in your horses, the road is too narrow here, it will be wider soon, and you can pass me then, if you foul my chariot you may bring both of us to a mischief. But Antilochus plied his whip, and drove faster, as though he had not heard him. They went side by side for about as far as a young man can hurl a disc from his shoulder when he is trying his strength, and then Menelaus's Mares drew behind. For he left off driving for fear the horses should foul one another and upset the chariots. Thus, while pressing on in quest of victory, they might both come headlong to the ground. Menelaus then upbraided Antilochus and said, There is no greater trickster of living than you are, go, and bad luck go with you. The Achaeans say not well that you have understanding, and come what may you shall not bear away the prize without sworn protest on my part. Then he called on his horses and said to them, Keep your pace, and slacken not. The limbs of the other horses will weary sooner than yours, for they are neither of them young. The horses feared the rebuke of their master, and went faster, so that they were soon nearly up with the others. Meanwhile the Achaeans from their seats were watching how the horses went, as they scoured the plain amid clouds of their own dust. Idomeneus captain of the Cretans was first to make out the running, for he was not in the thick of the crowd, but stood on the most commanding part of the ground. The driver was a long way off, but Idomeneus could hear him shouting, and could see the foremost horse quite plainly, a chestnut with a round white star, like the moon, on its forehead. He stood up and said among the Argives, My friends, princes and counselors of the Argives, can you see the running as well as I can? There seems to be another pair in front now, and another driver. Those that led off at the start must have been disabled out on the plain. I saw them at first making their way round the doubling post, but now, though I searched the plain of Troy, I cannot find them. Perhaps the reins fell from the driver's hand so that he lost command of his horses at the doubling post, and could not turn it. I suppose he must have been thrown out there, and broken his chariot, while his mares have left the course and gone off wildly in a panic. Come up and see for yourselves, I cannot make out for certain, but the driver seems an Aetolian by descent, ruler over the Argives, brave Diom the son of Tydeus. Ajax the son of Oileus took him up rudely and said, Idomeneus, why should you be in such a hurry to tell us all about it, when the Mares are still so far out upon the plain? You are none of the youngest, nor your eyes none of the sharpest, but you are always laying down the law. You have no right to do so, for there are better men here than you are. Eumelus's horses are in front now, as they always have been, and he is on the chariot holding the reins. The captain of the Cretans was angry, and answered, Ajax you are an excellent railer, but you have no judgment, and are wanting in much else as well, for you have a vile temper. I will wager you a tripod or cauldron, and Agamemnon son of Atreus shall decide whose horses are first. You will then know to your cost. Ajax son of Oileus was for making him an angry answer, and there would have been yet further brawling between them, 
had not Achilles risen in his place and said, Cease your railing, Ajax and Idomeneus. Is it not you would be scandalized if you saw any one else do the like, sit down and keep your eyes on the horses, they are speeding towards the winning post and will be bare directly. You will then both of you know whose horses are first, and whose come after. As he was speaking, the son of Tydeus came driving in, plying his whip lustily from his shoulder, and his horses stepping high as they flew over the course. The sand and grit rained thick on the driver, and the chariot inlaid with gold and tin ran close behind his fleet horses. There was little trace of wheel marks in the fine dust, and the horses came flying in at their utmost speed. Diam stayed them in the middle of the crowd, and the sweat from their manes and chests fell in streams on to the ground. Forthwith he sprang from his goodly chariot, and leaned his whip against his horse's yoke. Brave Stenelus now lost no time, but at once brought on the prize, and gave the woman and the ear-handled cauldron to his comrades to take away. Then he unyoked the horses. Next after him came an Antilochus of the race of Neleus, who had passed Menelaus by a trick and not by the fleetness of his horses. But even so Menelaus came in as close behind him as the wheel is to the horse that draws both the chariot and its master. The end hairs of a horse's tail touch the tire of the wheel, and there is never much space between wheel and horse when the chariot is going. Menelaus was no further than this behind Antilochus, though at first he had been a full disc's throw behind him. He had soon caught him up again, for Agamemnon's mare Eth kept pulling stronger and stronger, so that if the course had been longer he would have passed him, and there would not even have been a dead heat. Idomeneus brave squire Marians was about a spear's cast behind Menelaus his horses were slowest of all, and he was the worst driver. Last of them all came the son of Admetus, dragging his chariot and driving his horses on in front. When Achilles saw him he was sorry, and stood up among the Argives saying, The best man is coming in last. Let us give him a prize for it is reasonable. He shall have the second, but the first must go to the son of Tydeus. Thus did he speak and the others all of them applauded his saying, and were for doing as he had said, but Nestor's son Antilochus stood up and claimed his rights from the son of Peleus. Achilles, said he, I shall take it much amiss if you do this thing, you would rob me of my prize, because you think Eumelus's chariot and horses were thrown out, and himself too, good man that he is. He should have prayed duly to the immortals. He would not have come in last if he had done so. If you are sorry for him and so choose, you have much gold in your tents, with bronze, sheep, cattle and horses. Take something from this store if you would have the Achaean speak well of you, and give him a better prize even than that which you have now offered, but I will not give up the mare, and he that will fight me for her, let him come on. Achilles smiled as he heard this, and was pleased with Antilochus, who was one of his dearest comrades. So he said. Antilochus, if you would have me find Eumelus another prize, I will give him the bronze breastplate with a rim of tin running all round it which I took from Asteropaeus. It will be worth much money to him. He bade his comrade Automedon bring the breastplate from his tent, and he did so. Achilles then gave it over to Eumelus, who received it gladly. But Menelaus got up in a rage, furiously angry with Antilochus. An attendant placed his staff in his hands and bade the Argives keep silence, the hero then addressed them. Antilochus, said he, what is this from you who have been so far blameless? You have made me cut a poor figure and balk my horses by flinging your own in front of them, though yours are much worse than mine are. Therefore, O princes and counselors of the Argives, judge between us and show no favor, lest one of the Achaeans say, Menelaus has got the mare through lying in corruption. His horses were far inferior to Antilochus, but he has greater weight and influence. Nay, I will determine the matter myself, and no man will blame me, for I shall do what is just. Come here, Antilochus, and stand, as our custom is, whip in hand before your chariot and horses, lay your hand on your steeds, and swear by earth-encircling Neptune that you did not purposely and guilefully get in the way of my horses. And Antilochus answered, Forgive me, I am much younger, King Menelaus, than you are, you stand higher than I do and are the better man of the two, you know how easily young men are betrayed into indiscretion. 
their tempers are more hasty and they have less judgment, make due allowances therefore, and bear with me. I will of my own accord give up the mare that I have won, and if you claim any further chattel from my own possessions, I would rather yield it to you, at once, than fall from your good graces henceforth, and do wrong in the sight of heaven. The son of Nestor then took the mare and gave her over to Menelaus, whose anger was thus appeased. As when dew falls upon a field of ripening corn, and the lands are bristling with the harvest, even so, O Menelaus, was your heart made glad within you. He turned to Antilochus and said, Now, Antilochus, angry though I have been, I can give way to you of my own free will, you have never been headstrong nor ill-disposed hitherto, but this time your youth has got the better of your judgment. Be careful how you outweep your betters in future, no one else could have brought me round so easily, but your good father, your brother, and yourself have all of you had infinite trouble on my behalf. I therefore yield to your entreaty, and will give up the mare to you, mine though it indeed be, the people will thus see that I am neither harsh nor vindictive. With this he gave the mare over to Antilochus' comrade Nomon, and then took the cauldron. Marians, who had come in forth, carried off the two talents of gold, and the fifth prize, the two-handled urn, being unawarded, Achilles gave it to Nestor, going up to him among the assembled argives and saying, Take this, my good old friend. As an heirloom and memorial of the funeral of Patroclus, for you shall see him no more among the argives. I give you this prize though you cannot win one, you can now neither wrestle nor fight, and cannot enter for the javelin match nor foot races, for the hand of age has been laid heavily upon you. So saying he gave the urn over to Nestor, who received it gladly and answered, My son, all that you have said is true, there is no strength now in my legs and feet, nor can I hit out with my hands from either shoulder. Would that I were still young and strong as when the Epeans were burying King Amarincius in Buprasium, and his sons offered prizes in his honour. There was then none that could vie with me neither of the Epeans or the Pilians themselves nor the Aetolians. In boxing I overcame Clytomede son of Anops, and in wrestling, Ancius of Pluron who had come forward against me. Iphiclus was a good runner, but I beat him, and threw farther with my spear than either Phileus or Polydorus. In chariot racing alone did the two sons of Actor surpass me by crowding their horses in front of me, for they were angry at the way victory had gone, and at the greater part of the prizes remaining in the place in which they had been offered. They were twins, and the one kept on holding the reins, and holding the reins, while the other plied the whip. Such was I then, but now I must leave these matters to younger men. I must bow before the weight of years, but in those days I was eminent among heroes. And now, sir, go on with the funeral contests in honour of your comrade, gladly do I accept this urn, and my heart rejoices that you do not forget me but are ever mindful of my goodwill towards you, and of the respect due to me from the Achaeans. For all which may the grace of heaven be vouchsafed you in great abundance. Thereon the son of Peleus, when he had listened to all the thanks of Nestor, went about among the concourse of the Achaeans, and presently offered prizes for skill in the painful art of boxing. He brought out a strong mule, and made it fast in the middle of the crowd, a she-mule never yet broken, but six years old, when it is hardest of all to break them, this was for the victor, and for the vanquished he offered a double cup. Then he stood up and said among the Argives, son of Atreus, and all other Achaeans, I invite our two champion boxers to lay about them lustily and compete for these prizes. He to whom Apollo vouchsafes the greater endurance, and whom the Achaeans acknowledge as victor, shall take the mule back with him to his own tent, while he that is vanquished shall have the double cup. As he spoke there stood up a champion both brave and great stature, a skillful boxer, Epius, son of Panopeus. He laid his hand on the mule and said, Let the man who is to have the cup come hither, for none but myself will take the mule. I am the best boxer of all here present, and none can beat me. Is it not enough that I should fall short of you in actual fighting? Still, no man can be good at everything. I tell you plainly, and it shall come true. If any man will box with me I will bruise his body and break his bones, therefore let his friend stay here in a body and be at hand to take him away when I have done with him. They all held their peace, and no man rose save Euryalus son of Mesistius, who was son of Talos. 
Mesistius went once to Thebes after the fall of Oedipus, to attend his funeral, and he beat all the people of Cadmus. The son of Tydeus was Euryalus II, cheering him on and hoping heartily that he would win. First he put a waistband round him and then he gave him some well-cut thongs of ox hide. The two men being now girt went into the middle of the ring, and immediately fell to, heavily indeed did they punish one another and lay about them with their brawny fists. One could hear the horrid crashing of their jaws, and they sweated from every pore of their skin. Presently Epius came on and gave Euryalus a blow on the jaw as he was looking round, Euryalus could not keep his legs. They gave way under him in a moment and he sprang up with a bound, as a fish leaps into the air near some shore that is all bestrewn with Sirac, when Boreas furs the top of the waves, and then falls back into deep water. But noble Epius caught hold of him and raised him up, his comrades also came round him and led him from the ring, unsteady in his gait, his head hanging on one side, and spitting great clots of gore. They set him down in a swoon and then went to fetch the double cup. The son of Peleus now brought out the prizes for the third contest and showed them to the Argives. These were for the painful art of wrestling. For the winner there was a great tripod ready for setting upon the fire, and the Achaeans valued it among themselves at twelve oxen. For the loser he brought out a woman skilled in all manner of arts, and they valued her at four oxen. He rose and said among the Argives, Stand forward, you who will essay this contest. Forthwith uprose great Ajax the son of Telamon, and crafty Ulysses, full of wiles, rose also. The two girded themselves and went into the middle of the ring. They gripped each other in their strong hands like the rafters which some master builder frames for the roof of a high house to keep the wind out. Their backbones cracked as they tugged at one another with their mighty arms, and sweat rained from them in torrents. Many a bloody wheel sprang up on their sides and shoulders but they kept on striving with might and main for victory and to win the tripod. Ulysses could not throw Ajax, nor Ajax him, Ulysses was too strong for him. But when the Achaeans began to tire of watching them, Ajax said to Ulysses, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, you shall either lift me, or I you, and let Jove settle it between us. He lifted him from the ground as he spoke, but Ulysses did not forget his cunning. He hit Ajax in the hollow at back of his knee, so that he could not keep his feet, but fell on his back with Ulysses lying upon his chest, and all who saw it marveled. Then Ulysses in turn lifted Ajax and stirred him a little from the ground but could not lift him right off it, his knee sank under him, and the two fell side by side on the ground and were all begrimed with dust. They now sprang towards one another and were for wrestling yet a third time, but Achilles rose and stayed them. Put not each other further, said he, to such cruel suffering. The victory is with both alike, take each of you an equal prize, and let the other Achaeans now compete. Thus did he speak and they did even as he had said, and put on their shirts again after wiping the dust from off their bodies. The son of Peleus then offered prizes for speed in running, a mixing bowl beautifully wrought, of pure silver. It would hold six measures, and far exceeded all others in the whole world for beauty. It was the work of cunning artificers in Sidon, and had been brought into port by Phoenicians from beyond the sea, who had made a present of it to Thoas. Euenius son of Jason had given it to Patroclus in ransom of Priam's son Lycaon, and Achilles now offered it as a prize in honor of his comrade to him who should be the swiftest runner. For the second prize he offered a large ox, well fattened, while for the last there was to be half a talent of gold. He then rose and said among the Argives, Stand forward, you who will essay this contest. Forthwith uprose fleet Ajax son of Oileus, with cunning Ulysses, and Nestor's son Antilochus, the fastest runner among all the youth of his time. They stood side by side and Achilles showed them the goal. The course was set out for them from the starting post, and the son of Oileus took the lead at once, with Ulysses as close behind him as the shuttle is to a woman's bosom when she throws the woof across the warp and holds it close up to her. Even so close behind him was Ulysses, treading in his footprints before the dust could settle there, and Ajax could feel his breath on the back of his head as he ran swiftly on. The Achaeans all shouted applause as they saw him straining his utmost, and cheered him as he shot past them, 
but when they were now nearing the end of the course Ulysses prayed inwardly to Minerva. Hear me, he cried, and help my feet, O goddess. Thus did he pray, and Pallas Minerva heard his prayer. She made his hands and his feet feel light, and when the runners were at the point of pouncing upon the prize, Ajax. Through Minerva's spite slipped upon some offal that was lying there from the cattle which Achilles had slaughtered in honour of Patroclus, and his mouth and nostrils were all filled with cow dung. Ulysses therefore carried off the mixing bowl, for he got before Ajax and came in first. But Ajax took the ox and stood with his hand on one of its horns, spitting the dung out of his mouth. Then he said to the Argives, Alas, the goddess has spoiled my running, she watches over Ulysses and stands by him as though she were his own mother. Thus did he speak and they all of them laughed heartily. Antilochus carried off the last prize and smiled as he said to the bystanders, You all see, my friends, that now too the gods have shown their respect for seniority. Ajax is somewhat older than I am, and as for Ulysses, he belongs to an earlier generation, but he is hale in spite of his years, and no man of the Achaeans can run against him save only Achilles. He said this to pay a compliment to the son of Peleus, and Achilles answered, Antilochus, you shall not have praised me to no purpose, I shall give you an additional half-talent of gold. He then gave the half-talent to Antilochus, who received it gladly. Then the son of Peleus brought out the spear, helmet and shield that had been borne by Sarpedon, and were taken from him by Patroclus. He stood up and said among the Argives, We bid two champions put on their armor, take their keen blades, and make trial of one another in the presence of the multitude. Whichever of them can first wound the flesh of the other, cut through his armor, and draw blood, to him will I give this goodly Thracian sword inlaid with silver, which I took from Asteropaeus, but the armor let both hold in partnership. And I will give each of them a hearty meal in my own tent. Forthwith uprose great Ajax the son of Telamon, as also mighty Diom's son of Tydeus. When they had put on their armor each on his own side of the ring, they both went into the middle eager to engage, and with fire flashing from their eyes. The Achaeans marveled as they beheld them, and when the two were now close up with one another, thrice did they spring forward and thrice try to strike each other in close combat. Ajax pierced Diom's round shield, but did not draw blood, for the cuirass beneath the shield protected him. Thereon the son of Tydeus from over his huge shield kept aiming continually at Ajax's neck with the point of his spear, and the Achaeans alarmed for his safety bade them leave off fighting and divide the prize between them. Achilles then gave the great sword to the son of Tydeus, with its scabbard, and the leathern belt with which to hang it. Achilles next offered the massive iron quoit which mighty Aeacian had erewhile been used to hurl, until Achilles had slain him and carried it off in his ships along with other spoils. He stood up and said among the Argives, Stand forward, you who would essay this contest. He who wins it will have a store of iron that will last him five years as they go rolling round, and if his fair fields lie far from a town his shepherd or plowman will not have to make a journey to buy iron. For he will have a stock of it on his own premises. Then uprose the two mighty men Polypides and Leontius, with Ajax son of Telamon and noble Epius. They stood up one after the other and Epius took the quoit, whirled it, and flung it from him, which set all the Achaeans laughing. After him threw Leontius of the race of Mars. Ajax son of Telamon threw third, and sent the quoit beyond any mark that had been made yet. But when mighty Polypides took the quoit he hurled it as though it had been a stockman's stick which he sends flying about among his cattle when he is driving them, so far did his throw out distance those of the others. All who saw it roared applause, and his comrades carried the prize for him and set it on board his ship. Achilles next offered a prize of iron for archery, ten double-edged axes and ten with single edges, he set up a ship's mast, some way off upon the sands, and with a fine string tied a pigeon to it by the foot, this was what they were to aim at. Whoever, he said, can hit the pigeon shall have all the axes and take them away with him, he who hits the string without hitting the bird will have taken a worse aim and shall have the single-edged axes. Then uprose King Tusser, and Marians the stalwart squire of Idemonius rose also, they cast lots in a bronze helmet and the lot of Tusser fell first. He let fly with his arrow forthwith, but he did not promise hecatombs of firstling lambs to King Apollo, 
and missed his bird, for Apollo foiled his aim, but he hit the string with which the bird was tied, near its foot. The arrow cut the string clean through so that it hung down towards the ground, while the bird flew up into the sky, and the Achaeans shouted applause. Marians, who had his arrow ready while Tusser was aiming, snatched the bow out of his hand, and at once promised that he would sacrifice a hecatomb of first lane lambs to Apollo lord of the bow. Then espying the pigeon high up under the clouds, he hit her in the middle of the wing as she was circling upwards. The arrow went clean through the wing and fixed itself in the ground at Marion's feet, but the bird perched on the ship's mast hanging her head and with all her feathers drooping, the life went out of her, and she fell heavily from the mast. Marion's, therefore, took all ten double-edged axes, while Tusser bore off the single-edged ones to his ships. Then the son of Peleus brought in a spear and a cauldron that had never been on the fire. It was worth an ox, and was chased with a pattern of flowers and those that throw the javelin stood up, to wit the son of Atreus, king of men Agamemnon, and Marians, stalwart squire of Idomeneus. But Achilles spoke saying, Son of Atreus, we know how far you excel all others both in power and in throwing the javelin, take the cauldron back with you to your ships, but if it so please you, let us give the spear to Marians. This at least is what I should myself wish. King Agamemnon assented so he gave the bronze spear to Marians, and handed the goodly cauldron to Talthybius his esquire. Book 24 The assembly now broke up and the people went their ways each to his own ship. There they made ready their supper, and then bethought them of the blessed boon of sleep. But Achilles still wept for thinking of his dear comrade, and sleep, before whom all things bow, could take no hold upon him. This way and that did he turn as he yearned after the might and manfulness of Patroclus. He thought of all they had done together, and all they had gone through both on the field of battle and on the waves of the weary sea. As he dwelt on these things he wept bitterly and lay now on his side, now on his back, and now face downwards, till at last he rose and went out as one distraught to wander upon the seashore. Then, when he saw dawn breaking over beach and sea, he yoked his horses to his chariot, and bound the body of Hector behind it that he might drag it about. Thrice did he drag it round the tomb of the son of Menoetius, and then went back into his tent, leaving the body on the ground full length and with its face downwards. But Apollo would not suffer it to be disfigured, for he pitied the man, dead though he now was, therefore he shielded him with his golden aegis continually, that he might take no hurt while Achilles was dragging him. Thus shamefully did Achilles in his fury dishonor Hector, but the blessed gods looked down in pity from heaven, and urged Mercury, slayer of Argus, to steal the body. All were of this mind save only Juno, Neptune, and Jove's grey-eyed daughter, who persisted in the hate which they had ever borne towards Ilius with Priam and his people. For they forgave not the wrong done them by Alexandrus in disdaining the goddesses who came to him when he was in his sheepyards, and preferring her who had offered him a wanton to his ruin. When, therefore, the morning of the twelfth day had now come, Phoebus Apollo spoke among the immortals saying, You gods ought to be ashamed of yourselves, you are cruel and hard-hearted. Did not Hector burn you thigh bones of heifers and of unblemished goats? And now dare you not rescue even his dead body? for his wife to look upon, with his mother and child, his father Priam, and his people, who would forthwith commit him to the flames, and give him his due funeral rites. So, then, you would all be on the side of mad Achilles, who knows neither right nor ruth. He is like some savage lion that in the pride of his great strength and daring springs upon men's flocks and gorges on them. Even so has Achilles flung aside all pity, and all that conscience which at once so greatly banes yet greatly boons him that will heed it. Man may lose one far dearer than Achilles has lost, a son, it may be, or a brother born from his own mother's womb, yet when he has mourned him and wept over him he will let him bide, for it takes much sorrow to kill a man. Whereas Achilles, now that he has slain noble Hector, drags him behind his chariot round the tomb of his comrade. It were better of him, and for him, that he should not do so, for brave though he be we gods may take it ill that he should vent his fury upon dead clay. Juno spoke up in a rage. This were well, she cried, O lord of the silver bow, if you would give like honour to Hector and to Achilles. 
but Hector was mortal and suckled at a woman's breast, whereas Achilles is the offspring of a goddess whom I myself reared and brought up. I married her to Peleus, who is above measure dear to the immortals, you gods came all of you to her wedding. You feasted along with them yourself and brought your lyre, false, and fond of low company, that you have ever been. Then said Jove, Juno, be not so bitter. Their honour shall not be equal, but of all that dwell in Ilius, Hector was dearest to the gods, as also to myself, for his offerings never failed me. Never was my altar stinted of its dues, nor of the drink offerings and savour of sacrifice which we claim of right. I shall therefore permit the body of mighty Hector to be stolen. And yet this may hardly be without Achilles coming to know it, for his mother keeps night and day beside him. Let some one of you, therefore, send Thetis to me, and I will impart my counsel to her, namely that Achilles is to accept a ransom from Priam, and give up the body. On this Iris fleet as the wind went forth to carry his message. Down she plunged into the dark sea midway between Samos and rocky Imbrus, the waters hissed as they closed over her, and she sank into the bottom as the lead at the end of an ox horn, that is sped to carry death to fishes. She found Thetis sitting in a great cave with the other sea goddesses gathered round her, there she sat in the midst of them weeping for her noble son who was to fall far from his own land, on the rich plains of Troy. Iris went up to her and said, Rise Thetis, Jove, whose counsels fail not, bids you come to him. And Thetis answered, Why does the mighty God so bid me? I am in great grief, and shrink from going in and out among the immortals. Still, I will go, and the word that he may speak shall not be spoken in vain. The goddess took her dark veil, than which there can be no robe more sombre, and went forth with fleet Iris leading the way before her. The waves of the sea opened them a path, and when they reached the shore they flew up into the heavens, where they found the all-seeing son of Saturn with the blessed gods that live for ever assembled near him. Minerva gave up her seat to her, and she sat down by the side of Father Jove. Juno then placed a fair golden cup in her hand, and spoke to her in words of comfort, whereon Thetis drank and gave her back the cup. And the sire of gods and men was the first to speak. So, goddess, said he, for all your sorrow, and the grief that I well know reigns ever in your heart, you have come hither to Olympus, and I will tell you why I have sent for you. This nine days past the immortals have been quarrelling about Achilles' waster of cities and the body of Hector. The gods would have Mercury slayer of Argus steal the body, but in furtherance of our peace and amity henceforward, I will concede such honour to your son as I will now tell you. Go, then, to the host and lay these commands upon him. Say that the gods are angry with him, and that I am myself more angry than them all, in that he keeps Hector at the ships and will not give him up. He may thus fear me and let the body go. At the same time I will send Iris to great Priam to bid him go to the ships of the Achaeans, and ransom his son, taking with him such gifts for Achilles as may give him satisfaction. Silver-footed Thetis did as the god had told her, and forthwith down she darted from the topmost summits of Olympus. She went to her son's tents where she found him grieving bitterly, while his trusty comrades round him were busy preparing their morning meal, for which they had killed a great woolly sheep. His mother sat down beside him and caressed him with her hand saying, My son, how long will you keep on thus grieving and making moan? You are gnawing at your own heart, and think neither of food nor of woman's embraces. And yet these two were well, for you have no long time to live, and death with the strong hand of fate are already close beside you. Now, therefore, heed what I say, for I come as a messenger from Jove. He says that the gods are angry with you, and himself more angry than them all, in that you keep Hector at the ships and will not give him up. Therefore let him go, and accept a ransom for his body. And Achilles answered, So be it. If Olympian Jove of his own motion thus commands me, let him that brings the ransom bear the body away. Thus did mother and son talk together at the ships in long discourse with one another. Meanwhile the son of Saturn sent Iris to the strong city of Ilius. Go, said he, fleet Iris, from the mansions of Olympus, and tell King Priam and Ilius, that he is to go to the ships of the Achaeans and free the body of his dear son. 
he is to take such gifts with him as shall give satisfaction to Achilles, and he is to go alone, with no other Trojan, save only some honoured servant who may drive his mules and wagon, and bring back the body of him whom noble Achilles has slain. Let him have no thought nor fear of death in his heart, for we will send the slayer of Argus to escort him, and bring him within the tent of Achilles. Achilles will not kill him nor let another do so, for he will take heed to his ways and sin not, and he will entreat a suppliant with all honourable courtesy. On this Iris, fleet as the wind, sped forth to deliver her message. She went to Priam's house, and found weeping and lamentation therein. His sons were seated round their father in the outer courtyard, and their raiment was wet with tears, the old man sat in the midst of them with his mantle wrapped close about his body, and his head and neck all covered with the filth which he had clutched as he lay groveling in the mire. His daughters and his sons' wives went wailing about the house, as they thought of the many and brave men who lay dead, slain by the Argives. The messenger of Jove stood by Priam and spoke softly to him, but fear fell upon him as she did so. Take heart, she said, Priam offspring of Dardanus, take heart and fear not. I bring no evil tidings, but am minded well towards you. I come as a messenger from Jove, who though he be not near, takes thought for you and pities you. The Lord of Olympus bids you go and ransom noble Hector, and take with you such gifts as shall give satisfaction to Achilles. You are to go alone, with no Trojan, save only some honoured servant who may drive your mules and wagon, and bring back to the city the body of him whom noble Achilles has slain. You are to have no thought, nor fear of death, for Jove will send the slayer of Argus to escort you. When he has brought you within Achilles' tent, Achilles will not kill you nor let another do so, for he will take heed to his ways and sin not, and he will entreat a suppliant with all honourable courtesy. Iris went her way when she had thus spoken, and Priam told his sons to get a mule wagon ready, and to make the body of the wagon fast upon the top of its bed. Then he went down into his fragrant storeroom, high vaulted, and made of cedar wood, where his many treasures were kept, and he called Hecuba his wife. Wife, said he, a messenger has come to me from Olympus, and has told me to go to the ships of the Achaeans to ransom my dear son, taking with me such gifts as shall give satisfaction to Achilles. What think you of this matter? For my own part one am greatly moved to pass through the camps of the Achaeans and go to their ships. His wife cried aloud as she heard him, and said, Alas, what has become of that judgment for which you have been ever famous both among strangers and your own people? How can you venture alone to the ships of the Achaeans, and look into the face of him who has slain so many of your brave sons? You must have iron courage, for if the cruel savage sees you and lays hold on you, he will know neither respect nor pity. Let us then weep Hector from afar here in our own house, for when I gave him birth the threads of overruling fate were spun for him that dogs should eat his flesh far from his parents. In the house of that terrible man on whose liver I would fain fasten and devour it. Thus would I avenge my son, who showed no cowardice when Achilles slew him, and thought neither of flight nor of avoiding battle as he stood in defence of Trojan men and Trojan women. Then Priam said, I would go, do not therefore stay me or be as a bird of ill omen in my house, for you will not move me. Had it been some mortal man who had sent me some prophet or priest who divines from sacrifice, I should have deemed him false and have given him no heed. But now I have heard the goddess and seen her face to face, therefore I will go and her saying shall not be in vain. If it be my fate to die at the ships of the Achaeans even so would I have it. Let Achilles slay me, if I may but first have taken my son in my arms and mourned him to my heart's comforting. So saying he lifted the lids of his chests, and took out twelve goodly vestments. He took also twelve cloaks of single fold, twelve rugs, twelve fair mantles, and an equal number of shirts. He weighed out ten talents of gold, and brought moreover two burnished tripods, for cauldrons, and a very beautiful cup which the Thracians had given him when he had gone to them on an embassy. It was very precious, but he grudged not even this, so eager was he to ransom the body of his son. Then he chased all the Trojans from the court and rebuked them with words of anger. Out, he cried, shame and disgrace to me that you are. Have you no grief in your own homes that you are come to plague me here? Is it a small thing, 
think you, that the son of Saturn has sent this sorrow upon me, to lose the bravest of my sons? Nay, ye shall prove it in person, for now he is gone the Achaeans will have easier work in killing you. As for me, let me go down within the house of Hades, ere mine eyes behold the sacking and wasting of the city. He drove the men away with his staff, and they went forth as the old man sped them. Then he called to his sons, upbraiding Helenus, Paris, noble Agathon, Pammon, Antiphonus, polites of the loud battle cry, Deiphobus, Hippothus, and Dios. These nine did the old man call near him. Come to me at once, he cried, worthless sons who do me shame, would that you had all been killed at the ships rather than Hector. Miserable man that I am, I have had the bravest sons in all Troy, noble Nestor, Troilus the dauntless charioteer, and Hector who was a god among men, so that one would have thought he was son to an immortal, yet there is not one of them left. Mars has slain them and those of whom I am ashamed are alone left me. Liars, and light of foot, heroes of the dance, robbers of lambs and kids from your own people, why do you not get a wagon ready for me at once, and put all these things upon it that I may set out on my way? Thus did he speak, and they feared the rebuke of their father. They brought out a strong mule wagon, newly made, and set the body of the wagon fast on its bed. They took the mule yoke from the peg on which it hung, a yoke of boxwood with a knob on the top of it and rings for the reins to go through. Then they brought a yoke band eleven cubits long, to bind the yoke to the pole. They bound it on at the far end of the pole, and put the ring over the upright pin making it fast with three turns of the band on either side the knob, and bending the thong of the yoke beneath it. This done, they brought from the store chamber the rich ransom that was to purchase the body of Hector, and they set it all orderly on the wagon. Then they yoked the strong harness mules which the missions had on a time given as a goodly present to Priam, but for Priam himself they yoked horses which the old king had bred, and kept for own use. Thus heedfully did Priam and his servants see to the yoking of their cars at the palace. Then Hecuba came to them all sorrowful, with a golden goblet of wine in her right hand, that they might make a drink offering before they set out. She stood in front of the horses and said, Take this, make a drink offering to Father Jove, and since you are minded to go to the ships in spite of me, pray that you may come safely back from the hands of your enemies. Pray to the son of Saturn lord of the whirlwind, who sits on Ida and looks down over all Troy, pray him to send his swift messenger on your right hand, the bird of omen which is strongest and most dear to him of all birds. That you may see it with your own eyes and trust it as you go forth to the ships of the Danans. If all-seeing Jove will not send you this messenger, however set upon it you may be, I would not have you go to the ships of the Argives. And Priam answered, Wife, I will do as you desire me. It is well to lift hands in prayer to Jove, if so be he may have mercy upon me. With this the old man bade the serving woman pour pure water over his hands, and the woman came, bearing the water in a bowl. He washed his hands and took the cup from his wife, then he made the drink offering and prayed, standing in the middle of the courtyard and turning his eyes to heaven. Father Jove, he said, that rulest from Ida, most glorious and most great, grant that I may be received kindly and compassionately in the tents of Achilles. And send your swift messenger upon my right hand, the bird of omen which is strongest and most dear to you of all birds, that I may see it with my own eyes and trust it as I go forth to the ships of the Danans. So did he pray, and Jove the lord of counsel heard his prayer. Forthwith he sent an eagle, the most unerring portent of all birds that fly, the dusky hunter that men also call the black eagle. His wings were spread abroad on either side as wide as the well-made and well-bolted door of a rich man's chamber. He came to them flying over the city upon their right hands, and when they saw him they were glad and their hearts took comfort within them. The old man made haste to mount his chariot, and drove out through the inner gateway and under the echoing gatehouse of the outer court before him went the mules drawing the four-wheeled wagon, and driven by wise ideas. Behind these were the horses, which the old man lashed with his whip and drove swiftly through the city, while his friends followed after, wailing and lamenting for him as though he were on his road to death. As soon as they had come down from the city and had reached the plain, his sons and sons-in-law who had followed him went back to Ilius. 
but Priam and Ideas as they showed out upon the plain did not escape the ken of all-seeing Jove, who looked down upon the old man and pitied him. Then he spoke to his son Mercury and said, Mercury, for it is you who are the most disposed to escort men on their way, and to hear those whom you will hear, go. And so conduct Priam to the ships of the Achaeans that no other of the Danans shall see him nor take note of him until he reach the son of Peleus. Thus he spoke and Mercury, guide and guardian, slayer of Argus, did as he was told. Forthwith he bound on his glittering golden sandals with which he could fly like the wind over land and sea. He took the wand with which he seals men's eyes in sleep, or wakes them just as he pleases, and flew holding it in his hand till he came to Troy and to the Hellespont. To look at, he was like a young man of noble birth in the heyday of his youth and beauty with the down just coming upon his face. Now when Priam and Ideas had driven past the great tomb of Ileus, they stayed their mules and horses that they might drink in the river, for the shades of night were falling, when, therefore, Ideas saw Mercury standing near them he said to Priam. Take heed, descendant of Dardanus. Here is matter which demands consideration. I see a man who I think will presently fall upon us, let us fly with our horses, or at least embrace his knees and implore him to take compassion upon us. When he heard this the old man's heart failed him, and he was in great fear, he stayed where he was as one dazed, and the hair stood on end over his whole body. But the bringer of good luck came up to him and took him by the hand, saying, Whither, father, are you thus driving your mules and horses in the dead of night when other men are asleep? Are you not afraid of the fierce Achaeans who are hard by you, so cruel and relentless? Should some one of them see you bearing so much treasure through the darkness of the flying night, what would not your state then be? You are no longer young, and he who is with you is too old to protect you from those who would attack you. For myself, I will do you no harm, and I will defend you from any one else, for you remind me of my own father. And Priam answered, It is indeed as you say, my dear son, nevertheless some god has held his hand over me, in that he has sent such a wayfarer as yourself to meet me so opportunely. You are so comely in mien and figure, and your judgment is so excellent that you must come of blessed parents. Then said the slayer of Argus, guide and guardian, Sir, all that you have said is right. But tell me and tell me true, are you taking this rich treasure to send it to a foreign people where it may be safe? Or are you all leaving strong Ileus in dismay now that your son has fallen who was the bravest man among you and was never lacking in battle with the Achaeans? And Priam said, Who are you, my friend, and who are your parents, that you speak so truly about the fate of my unhappy son? The slayer of Argus, guide and guardian, answered him, Sir, you would prove me, that you question me about noble Hector. Many a time have I set eyes upon him in battle when he was driving the Argives to their ships and putting them to the sword. We stood still and marveled, for Achilles in his anger with the son of Atreus suffered us not to fight. I am his squire, and came with him in the same ship. I am a Myrmidon, and my father's name is Polyctor, he is a rich man and about as old as you are, he has six sons besides myself, and I am the seventh. We cast lots, and it fell upon me to sail hither with Achilles. I am now come from the ships on to the plain, for with daybreak the Achaeans will set battle in array about the city. They chafe at doing nothing, and are so eager that their princes cannot hold them back. Then answered Priam, If you are indeed the squire of Achilles son of Peleus, tell me now the whole truth. Is my son still at the ships, or has Achilles hewn him limb from limb, and given him to his hounds? Sir, replied the slayer of Argus, guide and guardian, neither hounds nor vultures have yet devoured him. He is still just lying at the tents by the ship of Achilles, and though it is now twelve days that he has lain there, his flesh is not wasted nor have the worms eaten him although they feed on warriors. At daybreak Achilles drags him cruelly round the sepulchre of his dear comrade, but it does him no hurt. You should come yourself and see how he lies fresh as dew, with the blood all washed away, and his wounds every one of them closed though many pierced him with their spears. Such care have the blessed gods taken of your brave son, for he was dear to them beyond all measure. The old man was comforted as he heard him and said, My son, see what a good thing it is to have made due offerings to the immortals. 
For as sure as that he was born my son never forgot the gods that hold Olympus, and now they requite it to him even in death. Accept therefore at my hands this goodly chalice. Guard me and with heaven's help guide me till I come to the tent of the son of Peleus. Then answered the slayer of Argus, guide and guardian, Sir, you are tempting me in playing upon my youth, but you shall not move me, for you are offering me presents without the knowledge of Achilles whom I fear and hold a great guilt to defraud. Lest some evil presently befall me. But as your guide I would go with you even to Argos itself, and would guard you so carefully whether by sea or land, that no one should attack you through making light of him who was with you. The bringer of good luck then sprang on to the chariot, and seizing the whip and reins he breathed fresh spirit into the mules and horses. When they reached the trench and the wall that was before the ships, those who were on guard had just been getting their suppers, and the slayer of Argus threw them all into a deep sleep. Then he drew back the bolts to open the gates, and took Priam inside with the treasure he had upon his wagon. Ere long they came to the lofty dwelling of the son of Peleus for which the Myrmidons had cut pine and which they had built for their king. When they had built it they thatched it with coarse tussock grass which they had mown out on the plain, and all round it they made a large courtyard, which was fenced with stakes set close together. The gate was barred with a single bolt of pine which it took three men to force into its place, and three to draw back so as to open the gate, but Achilles could draw it by himself. Mercury opened the gate for the old man, and brought in the treasure that he was taking with him for the son of Peleus. Then he sprang from the chariot on to the ground and said, Sir, it is I, immortal Mercury, that am come with you, for my father sent me to escort you. I will now leave you, and will not enter into the presence of Achilles, for it might anger him that a god should befriend mortal men thus openly. Go you within, and embrace the knees of the son of Peleus, beseech him by his father, his lovely mother, and his son, thus you may move him. With these words Mercury went back to high Olympus. Priam sprang from his chariot to the ground, leaving Ideas where he was, in charge of the mules and horses. The old man went straight into the house where Achilles, loved of the gods, was sitting. There he found him with his men seated at a distance from him, only two, the hero Automedon, and Alcimus of the race of Mars, were busy in attendance about his person, for he had but just done eating and drinking, and the table was still there. King Priam entered without their seeing him, and going right up to Achilles he clasped his knees and kissed the dread murderous hands that had slain so many of his sons. As when some cruel spite has befallen a man that he should have killed someone in his own country, and must fly to a great man's protection in a land of strangers, and all marvel who see him, even so did Achilles marvel as he beheld Priam. The others looked one to another and marveled also, but Priam besought Achilles saying, Think of your father, O Achilles like unto the gods, who is such even as I am, on the sad threshold of old age. It may be that those who dwell near him harass him, and there is none to keep war and ruin from him. Yet when he hears of you being still alive, he is glad, and his days are full of hope that he shall see his dear son come home to him from Troy. But I, wretched man that I am, had the bravest in all Troy for my sons, and there is not one of them left. I had fifty sons when the Achaeans came here. Nineteen of them were from a single womb, and the others were born to me by the women of my household. The greater part of them has fierce Mars laid low, and Hector, him who was alone left, him who was the guardian of the city and ourselves, him have you lately slain. Therefore I am now come to the ships of the Achaeans to ransom his body from you with a great ransom. Fear, O Achilles, the wrath of heaven. Think on your own father and have compassion upon me, who am the more pitiable, for I have steeled myself as no man yet has ever steeled himself before me, and have raised to my lips the hand of him who slew my son. Thus spoke Priam, and the heart of Achilles yearned as he bethought him of his father. He took the old man's hand and moved him gently away. The two wept bitterly, Priam, as he lay at Achilles' feet, weeping for Hector, and Achilles now for his father and now for Patroclus, till the house was filled with their lamentation. But when Achilles was now sated with grief and had unburthened the bitterness of his sorrow, he left his seat and raised the old man by the hand, in pity for his white hair and beard, then he said, Unhappy man, you have indeed been greatly daring. 
how could you venture to come alone to the ships of the Achaeans, and enter the presence of him who has slain so many of your brave sons? You must have iron courage, sit now upon this seat, and for all our grief we will hide our sorrows in our hearts, for weeping will not avail us. The immortals know no care, yet the lot they spin for man is full of sorrow. On the floor of Jove's palace there stand two urns, the one filled with evil gifts, and the other with good ones. He for whom Jove the Lord of Thunder mixes the gifts he sends, will meet now with good and now with evil fortune. But he to whom Jove sends none but evil gifts will be pointed at by the finger of scorn, the hand of famine will pursue him to the ends of the world, and he will go up and down the face of the earth, respected neither by gods nor men. Even so did it befall Peleus, the gods endowed him with all good things from his birth upwards, for he reigned over the Myrmidons excelling all men in prosperity and wealth, and mortal though he was they gave him a goddess for his bride. But even on him too did heaven send misfortune, for there is no race of royal children born to him in his house, save one son who is doomed to die all untimely. Nor may I take care of him now that he is growing old, for I must stay here at Troy to be the bane of you and your children. And you too, O Priam, I have heard that you were aforetime happy. They say that in wealth and plenitude of offspring you surpassed all that is in Lesbos, the realm of Makar to the northward, Phrygia that is more inland, and those that dwell upon the great Hellespont. But from the day when the dwellers in heaven sent this evil upon you, war and slaughter have been about your city continually. Bear up against it, and let there be some intervals in your sorrow. Mourn as you may for your brave son, you will take nothing by it. You cannot raise him from the dead, ere you do so yet another sorrow shall befall you. And Priam answered, O king, bid me not be seated, while Hector is still lying uncared for in your tents, but accept the great ransom which I have brought you, and give him to me at once that I may look upon him. May you prosper with the ransom and reach your own land in safety, seeing that you have suffered me to live and to look upon the light of the sun. Achilles looked at him sternly and said, Vex me, sir, no longer. I am of myself minded to give up the body of Hector. My mother, daughter of the old man of the sea, came to me from Jove to bid me deliver it to you. Moreover I know well, O Priam, and you cannot hide it, that some god has brought you to the ships of the Achaeans, for else, no man however strong and in his prime would dare to come to our host. He could neither pass our guard unseen, nor draw the bolt of my gates thus easily, therefore, provoke me no further, lest I sin against the word of Jove, and suffer you not, suppliant though you are, within my tents. The old man feared him and obeyed. Then the son of Peleus sprang like a lion through the door of his house, not alone, but with him went his two squires Automaton and Alcimus who were closer to him than any others of his comrades now that Patroclus was no more. These unyoked the horses and mules, and bade Priam's herald and attendant be seated within the house. They lifted the ransom for Hector's body from the wagon. But they left two mantles and a goodly shirt, that Achilles might wrap the body in them when he gave it to be taken home. Then he called to his servants and ordered them to wash the body and anoint it, but he first took it to a place where Priam should not see it, lest if he did so, he should break out in the bitterness of his grief, and enrage Achilles. Who might then kill him and sin against the word of Jove. When the servants had washed the body and anointed it, and had wrapped it in a fair shirt and mantle, Achilles himself lifted it on to a bier, and he and his men then laid it on the wagon. He cried aloud as he did so and called on the name of his dear comrade, Be not angry with me, Patroclus, he said, if you hear even in the house of Hades that I have given Hector to his father for a ransom. It has been no unworthy one, and I will share it equitably with you. Achilles then went back into the tent and took his place on the richly inlaid seat from which he had risen, by the wall that was at right angles to the one against which Priam was sitting. Sir, he said, your son is now laid upon his bier and is ransomed according to desire, you shall look upon him when you him away at daybreak, for the present let us prepare our supper. Even lovely Niobe had to think about eating, though her twelve children, six daughters and six lusty sons, had been all slain in her house. Apollo killed the sons with arrows from his silver bow, to punish Niobe, and Diana slew the daughters, because Niobe had vaunted herself against Leto. 
She said Leto had borne two children only, whereas she had herself borne many, whereon the two killed the many. Nine days did they lie weltering, and there was none to bury them, for the son of Saturn turned the people into stone. But on the tenth day the gods in heaven themselves buried them, and Niobe then took food, being worn out with weeping. They say that somewhere among the rocks on the mountain pastures of Sipolis, where the nymphs live that haunt the river Achilles, there, they say, she lives in stone and still nurses the sorrows sent upon her by the hand of heaven. Therefore, noble sir, let us two now take food, you can weep for your dear son hereafter as you are bearing him back to Ilius, and many a tear will he cost you. With this Achilles sprang from his seat and killed a sheep of silvery whiteness, which his followers skinned and made ready all in due order. They cut the meat carefully up into smaller pieces, spitted them, and drew them off again when they were well roasted. Automaton brought bread in fair baskets and served it round the table, while Achilles dealt out the meat, and they laid their hands on the good things that were before them. As soon as they had had enough to eat and drink, Priam, descendant of Dardanus, marveled at the strength and beauty of Achilles for he was as a god to see, and Achilles marveled at Priam as he listened to him and looked upon his noble presence. When they had gazed their fill Priam spoke first. And now, O king, he said, take me to my couch that we may lie down and enjoy the blessed boon of sleep. Never once have my eyes been closed from the day your hands took the life of my son. I have groveled without ceasing in the mire of my stable yard, making moan and brooding over my countless sorrows. Now, moreover, I have eaten bread and drunk wine, hitherto I have tasted nothing. As he spoke Achilles told his men and the women servants to set beds in the room that was in the gatehouse, and make them with good red rugs, and spread coverlets on the top of them with woolen cloaks for Priam and Ideas to wear. So the maids went out carrying a torch and got the two beds ready in all haste. Then Achilles said laughingly to Priam, Dear sir, you shall lie outside, lest some counsellor of those who in due course keep coming to advise with me should see you here in the darkness of the flying night, and tell it to Agamemnon. This might cause delay in the delivery of the body. And now tell me and tell me true, for how many days would you celebrate the funeral rites of noble Hector? Tell me, that I may hold aloof from war and restrain the host. And Priam answered, Since, then, you suffer me to bury my noble son with all due rites, do thus, Achilles, and I shall be grateful. You know how we are pent up within our city. It is far for us to fetch wood from the mountain, and the people live in fear. Nine days, therefore, will we mourn Hector in my house, on the tenth day we will bury him and there shall be a public feast in his honour. On the eleventh we will build a mound over his ashes, and on the twelfth, if there be need, we will fight. And Achilles answered, All, King Priam, shall be as you have said. I will stay our fighting for as long a time as you have named. As he spoke he laid his hand on the old man's right wrist, in token that he should have no fear. Thus then did Priam and his attendant sleep there in the forecourt, full of thought, while Achilles lay in an inner room of the house, with fair Briseis by his side. And now both gods and mortals were fast asleep through the livelong night, but upon Mercury alone, the bringer of good luck. Sleep could take no hold for he was thinking all the time how to get King Priam away from the ships without his being seen by the strong force of sentinels. He hovered therefore over Priam's head and said, Sir, now that Achilles has spared your life, you seem to have no fear about sleeping in the thick of your foes. You have paid a great ransom, and have received the body of your son. Were you still alive and a prisoner the sons whom you have left at home would have to give three times as much to free you, and so it would be if Agamemnon and the other Achaeans were to know of your being here. When he heard this the old man was afraid and roused his servant Mercury then yoked their horses and mules, and drove them quickly through the host so that no man perceived them. When they came to the ford of Eddying Xanthus, begotten of immortal Jove, Mercury went back to high Olympus, and dawn in robe of saffron began to break over all the land. Priam and Ideas then drove on toward the city lamenting and making moan, and the mules drew the body of Hector. No one neither man nor woman saw them, till Cassandra, fair as golden Venus standing on Pergamus, caught sight of her dear father in his chariot, and his servant that was the city's herald with him. Then she saw him that was lying upon the bier, 
drawn by the mules, and with a loud cry she went about the city saying, Come hither Trojans, men and women, and look on Hector. If ever you rejoice to see him coming from battle when he was alive, look now on him that was the glory of our city and all our people. At this there was not man nor woman left in the city, so great a sorrow had possessed them. Hard by the gates they met Priam as he was bringing in the body. Hector's wife and his mother were the first to mourn him, they flew towards the wagon and laid their hands upon his head, while the crowd stood weeping round them. They would have stayed before the gates, weeping and lamenting the livelong day to the going down of the sun, had not Priam spoken to them from the chariot and said, Make way for the mules to pass you. Afterwards when I have taken the body home you shall have your fill of weeping. On this the people stood asunder, and made a way for the wagon. When they had borne the body within the house they laid it upon a bed and seated minstrels round it to lead the dirge, whereon the women joined in the sad music of their lament. Foremost among them all Andromache led their wailing as she clasped the head of mighty Hector in her embrace. Husband, she cried, you have died young, and leave me in your house a widow. He of whom we are the ill-starred parents is still a mere child, and I fear he may not reach manhood. Ere he can do so our city will be raised and overthrown, for you who watched over it are no more, you who were its saviour, the guardian of our wives and children. Our women will be carried away captives to the ships, and I among them. While you, my child, who will be with me will be put to some unseemly tasks, working for a cruel master. Or, maybe, some Achaean will hurl you, O miserable death, from our walls, to avenge some brother, son, or father whom Hector slew. Many of them have indeed bitten the dust at his hands, for your father's hand in battle was no light one. Therefore do the people mourn him. You have left, O Hector, sorrow unutterable to your parents, and my own grief is greatest of all, for you did not stretch forth your arms and embrace me as you lay dying. Nor say to me any words that might have lived with me in my tears night and day for evermore. Bitterly did she weep the while, and the women joined in her lament. Hecuba in her turn took up the strains of woe. Hector, she cried, dearest to me of all my children. So long as you were alive the gods loved you well, and even in death they have not been utterly unmindful of you, for when Achilles took any other of my sons, he would sell him beyond the seas, to Samos Imbrus or rugged Lemnos. And when he had slain you two with his sword, many a time did he drag you round the sepulchre of his comrade, though this could not give him life, yet here you lie all fresh as dew, and comely as one whom Apollo has slain with his painless shafts. Thus did she too speak through her tears with bitter moan, and then Helen for a third time took up the strain of lamentation. Hector, said she, dearest of all my brothers-in-law, for I am wife to Alexandrus who brought me hither to Troy, would that I had died ere he did so, twenty years are come and gone since I left my home and came from over the sea. But I have never heard one word of insult or unkindness from you. When another would chide with me, as it might be one of your brothers or sisters or of your brother's wives. Or my mother-in-law, for Priam was as kind to me as though he were my own father, you would rebuke and check them with words of gentleness and goodwill. Therefore my tears flow both for you and for my unhappy self, for there is no one else in Troy who is kind to me, but all shrink and shudder as they go by me. She wept as she spoke and the vast crowd that was gathered round her joined in her lament. Then King Priam spoke to them saying, Bring wood, O Trojans, to the city, and fear no cunning ambush of the Argives. For Achilles when he dismissed me from the ships gave me his word that they should not attack us until the morning of the twelfth day. Forthwith they yoked their oxen and mules and gathered together before the city. Nine days long did they bring in great heaps of wood, and on the morning of the tenth day with many tears they took brave Hector forth, laid his dead body upon the summit of the pile, and set the fire thereto. Then when the child of morning, rosy-fingered dawn, appeared on the eleventh day, the people again assembled, round the pyre of mighty Hector. When they were got together, they first quenched the fire with wine wherever it was burning, and then his brothers and comrades with many a bitter tear gathered his white bones, wrapped them in soft robes of purple, and laid them in a golden urn. Which they placed in a grave and covered over with large stones set close together. 
Then they built a barrow hurriedly over it keeping guard on every side lest the Achaeans should attack them before they had finished. When they had heaped up the barrow they went back again into the city, and being well assembled they held high feast in the house of Priam their king. Thus, then, did they celebrate the funeral of Hector tamer of horses.